Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so thanks for the introduction. Uh, I'm uh, John DeCaster. I work with the Human Centric AI uh, Division at TRI. Uh, yeah, thanks for inviting me to this workshop. This is a great opportunity to kind of, uh, sorry, um, introduce some of the work that we're that we're doing, and I'm going to try to. Oops. Let me just try to hide this first. So sorry. Um, yeah, it gives me the opportunity to, to introduce some of the work that we're doing in, in this uh, kind of field. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about learning descriptions of risky human behavior using temporal logics. Um, this is joint work with uh, MIT as well as <clears throat> uh, folks from uh, Lehigh University. Uh, which I will introduce and Stanford as well, which I'll introduce as we go along. So yeah, so um, so why does risk matter? I mean, it's it's kind of, um, don't wanna belabor the kind of statistics uh, that you see the headlines, but yeah, there's there's a lot of uh, on-road, you know, fatalities each year. I mean, this, this year, uh, this past year was kind of a record number since 16 years ago um, for the number of fatalities. Um, but if we unpack why these fatalities kind of exist, um, you can see that there's like, you know, various driving behaviors that contribute to this very kind of uh, kind of plain to see, you know, driving too fast uh, or big front runners uh, under the influence, you know, failure to yield the right of way, um, you know, keeping the proper lane or distracted or things like this. So these are very rule driven, like you can imagine rules the road even being kind of mapped onto some of these kinds of uh, kinds of risks. So um, in terms of defensive driving, there's a lot of, you know, kind of tests for humans, how humans do this. And this particular one is, is about like human going in and annotating which events are, of this driving scenario are, are kind of risky. So you have this, this van in front that's braking constantly. Um, and so you have to kind of like understand when these risks occur and like, and basically what they are. So you have, you know, a lot of clutter. It, it can't, like, you can't assign risk to everything in the scene. Otherwise, this problem will be incredibly intractable. But, let, you know, you have to pick out the key parts of the scene, like that oncoming car or, like, uh, pedestrians jaywalking and so forth. So even for humans, I mean, this is very difficult. I mean, there is, in that minute-long segment, there is probably about 20, you know, key moments to kind of be aware of. Um, and, and an object to kind of be aware of in the scene. So, I mean, this is a very difficult problem even for humans, but even for an autonomous car, like if you were to encode this in an autonomy system, um, you want to build in some kind of risk awareness. And so to do this, um, you basically take, you know, you, you formulate a cost function and within this cost function, there's several features or factors that involve, um, you know, if the, uh, the light is red or the intersection is occupied, uh, you know, I want to assign a cost to it. If I uh, exceed lane bounds, I want to assign another cost to it. Um, speed and comfort all, all contribute. There's also, you know, how close you are to obstacles in the environment as well. And yeah, the world is, is um, uncertain. There's, you know, we can treat this cost as a random variable. So um, basically we can, Use this use certain machinery to kind of understand how to kind of build risk into our systems, and so to do that in a principled way, we we can employ using this notion of you know if if we're in an uncertain world we have uncertainty, we can build uh, risk metrics like this row here, um, and try to minimize it. So we're trying to minimize basically the our tolerance for accepting certain amounts of risk um, incurred to us, subject to some very hard constraints possibly. So you can even you know, make this even more strict um, so that you don't ever exceed certain bounds. So to do this, you can employ some, you know, the standard like entropic risk where you can say like something like this, where you have an order of beta log of the expected value of the exponential, the negative beta times the cost, and you can transit between the risk seeking and risk averse regimes um, by simply kind of perturbing this data or, or you know, going between these. I mean, typically I wanna build our systems unless we're kind of doing adversarial trust testing on our system to kind of this regime of risk neutral to risk averse. And so we have a lot of tools we can employ here. We can say, you know, we can um, take these metrics like, you know, if we want to be risk neutral, take the expected cost. If we want to be worst case, we take, you know, a beta very, very, very uh, negative. Um, and we can kind of employ kind of things like 
uh, value at risk and, and uh, conditional value at risk to kind of um, make these things more concrete and you know, to our liking. So, I mean, there's still this problem though that uh, it doesn't, this doesn't solve the problem of, of this risk attribution problem, which is kind of pervasive. It's, it's one where you know, you're still um, treating everything in the, in the world as, as the same. And basically all the features are kind of like as a designer, you don't ever kind of unpack, you know, it, it's very rare to unpack these things like, or it's, it's kind of, uh, yeah, kind of error prone to unpack these things yourself. Um, so, but you would like to kind of untangle key things in the, in the environment or in the scene, like if the screen car was a speeding car and let's say it just ran a stop sign, for instance, then you want to attribute maybe a, a higher degree of risk than the blue car, which is maybe driving very conservatively if you were the red car and, and from the perspective of the red car. So everything else being equal, the, the, the green car would appear to you as being a more looming menace than, than, the, than the blue one. Um, so, okay, so how do we learn a human's notion of risk? Kind of like how humans reason about this using uh, this formal language, using formal languages. So I guess if you take um, the GSA's word for it and you take the, the six most unsafe driving behaviors from that, you can see that there's basically a lot of, um, you know, there, there are very uh, well-defined kinds of things that you want to try to avoid. Like in proper speed, right of way, driving, you know, around the lane in a kind of a ad hoc way. Um, and if you peel these back further, you can kind of look at things like, um, you know, obeying the three second rule, or you know, things like look ahead and look behind. Like these are perception kind of things. Like look, but basically attending to the right things in the in the environment. And um, yeah, and things like perception distance and. Uh, turning into the appropriate lane without, you know, uh, crossing into other lanes and so forth. And the examples, of course, abound. In, in the real world, you have, you know, crossing um, unprotected intersections, uh, dense vehicles, uh, jaywalkers, and et cetera. So this has a uh, very, uh, yeah, these have very palpable things and very real kind of examples to kind of back them up. So let me take it aside for a moment and kind of propose the signal temporal logic, which um, NOC uh, proposed it or showed some temporal logic uh, constructs, but the signal temporal logic is about kind of um, being able to reason on signals, whether they're uh, continuous, uh, continuous time or discrete time, but reasoning on continuous valued signals and being able to kind of express uh, different properties about them. So, and, and test whether or not these properties actually hold. So one property could be reachability, another safety, there's liveness, attraction, response. And the way this kind of uh, gets put together is like even if, so within each of these uh, you know, temporal operators, you can assign time bounds to each one of them and actually understand, you know, be able to express things like um, always from now till 10 seconds from now, if a pedestrian is seen closer than 10 meters ahead of me, the car must come to a complete stop in five seconds. So this is the formula for that. And, and there's a go between between uh, that and kind of a formal, formal language, very precise kind of English statement. And so if you were to take kind of an example where you have a signal and you were to kind of um, apply, oops, uh, yeah, apply, a, apply a formula onto it that let's say it's from now till a uh, half second from now, eventually I want X to rise above one, then you can have a satisfaction signal that says basically the sliding window from now till 0.5 seconds has to, um, is, yeah, uh, if, the, if the signal goes above that, above one during that, during that window, then I assign a one, I, I, I assign a true to that and false otherwise. So that's the satisfaction of, of STL. Uh, an example of that. Uh, one other property is you can assign robust semantics to this, which um, basically allows you to say if I, well, instead of having that, uh, you know, Boolean value, I can assign a, a, a degree to which I uh, satisfy or, or, or don't satisfy this, this, this formula here. And so you can say something like, you know, obviously the blue signal goes far above uh, one 
initially, and then the next time it goes above one, it only goes a small amount. So, you, so the robust semantics is sensitive to that. So this doesn't quite work for our, our case because we want to have something that is able to reason online. So you're reasoning about things that happen and unfold as you go. So to do that, to make some, some of this work, to, to actually make this work in a, in a learning framework, um, which is kind of where we're going with this, um, we want to actually uh, use employee pastime STL, which is basically just a, you know, we're shifting the, um, uh, the traditional semantics of STL, which is kind of uh, uh, looking into the future from the current time step to something where you're looking into the past from the current time step. And so that's kind of what uh, one augmentation we, we have to do. And that's discussed in the paper that we co-author with Chow Lee. Um, another uh, adjustment is that we need to make uh, parametric uh, reasoning. So we have to understand, you know, uh, instead of giving the, the formula precisely, we have this alpha and epsilon to kind of work with us. So we can work with these parameters and be able to kind of take an optimizer and actually learn these values from data. So these alpha, the alpha can modulate the, the signal and of course the epsilon kind of adjusts the threshold which we kind of uh, do or don't satisfy this, this formula. And then with that machinery, we can actually use this risk specification to um, understand kind of basically what, um, to bring this into kind of the, the framework that we had envisioned that I brought up uh, earlier. So this alpha is again, the predicate function that example we had like, uh, we would use epsilon minus alpha x as our alpha, as our as our predicate function here, and then our risk measure is something like you know uh, CVAR, uh, expected cost, or anything like this. So using that, we can insert that directly into each of the predicates of our STL formula. In this case, if we were to write a formula out that said okay, our safe neighbor agent should always keep a safe distance in order for me to feel comfortable, you know, living with a safe neighbor, um, should always keep a safe distance from the ego vehicle and drive near its center lane. And if the ego vehicle is near the intersection, then it should either be far away or drive slowly. So that's, that's basically the formula that we're, um, that the running example that we're using. And so we can use this risk metric and insert that into each of these, uh, I guess, root uh, uh, leaf nodes of, of our computational tree, which we can construct from this formula and then propagate that all the way up to, um, to the top, to the root node. And from there, we can actually recover a, a overall risk for the entire form. So this is, um, so again, we show this, but we're actually using some of the um, work that Karen Ling did with uh, back propagation through STL in order to actually um, do this in a differentiable way so that we can actually um, uh, so we actually optimize for the parameters that we just, that, that we left kind of free. In the case, just taking a step back, so why use formal definitions for risk at all? So the capacity really to learn from the salient features of uh, the scene from humans is, is really an important property that we want to, to, um, to kind of uh, still, still have. Uh, but black box uh, methods can do that, can, can do that. But, um, but, but this, this formalism actually allows us to make these more interpretable. So we're, we, yeah, so we can give and take with interpretability. Um, if we express the, the right sentiment, then we can actually learn what, uh, um, what humans do and, and kind of match that um, and do it in an interpretable way. So we can also formally verify the system. So we can use this artifact to actually um, do formal verification to prove things. We can uh, still use the human as a final kind of go-between between, you know, what formula we learn and actually what gets implemented. And we have at our disposal, you know, semantic maps and everything. So that allows us to kind of like create these, create a lot of these predicates and, and actually fix some of these parameters as well. Yeah, so how do we learn risk? So this is work done in conjunction with MIT, with Xiao Li, uh, Christy Ambasil, uh, Sturtash Karaman, and Daniel LaRouche. And so we're looking again at the problem of how do we account for neighboring vehicles differently um, while we're driving. And so to do that, we, we first solve a trajectory generation problem. So we form a cost function that basically allows us to, you know, input things like follow the lane, you know, 
uh, apply a certain control effort. We have these, these uh, variables W, which are, are free, they're not, they're learned. Um, and again, um, where we're going to, if those variables are, are known, then we can, um, we can form a well-formed cost. And, but what we're focused on here is actually the, the second term of these terms, which is called C80, which is the other cars. And that's actually what we're trying to do to, to learn is a is a kind of a more or less a coefficient on this uh, potential function term, which assigns kind of risk to uh, uniformly to different obstacles in the scene, and then solve this using an MPC. And then we have uh, on, on the left is, is the risk map. So it basically tells us, you know, um, you know, we have a sensing region, which is that shaded one, we have a trajectory plan, which we were, we're trying to solve for and again, we have we can have track belief states for the other vehicles, which could be done using extended cumulative filters and the like. And so that forms the uh, inner loop for this problem. The outer loop, of course, is is learning those parameters, learning those Ws, learning the um, parameters underlying the, the logical formula we introduce. And so to do that, we do is a, use a variant of uh, IOC and first optimal control, and we. To do that, we sample trajectories from the, the generated distribution, iterate until we get the, uh, and also from the demonstrated distribution, iterate on this uh, argmin until we get to um, a, a feasible set of parameters, uh, theta star. Yeah, and so um, just as an example of how this unrolls, you can see that this is an unprotected uh, intersection and you see an, the green car and the red, the green car is the uh, ground truth. The red car is our risk net that's trying to mimic the, the ground truth. And you can, and the, the kind of circle dashed car there is the one that's entering the intersection. As it enters the intersection, it, um, it becomes more whitish, it becomes more bright. So you can see that, that the risk uh, network is actually um, increasing when it's in, in the intersection and then decreasing as it travels away from the ego car. So that's what we expect to see. Um, but also remark that we can also use this risk net for um, logic net for online monitoring. So you can actually run, execute this very quickly and say, okay, uh, does my formula hold or not hold? If I'm just applying this at open loop at, you know, at runtime with a car driving on the road. And to do that, we can, and a further advantage is we can crawl up this tree and understand which parts of these uh, like if you see a, a risk concern, you can understand why that risk concern occurred according to the, the formula. So according to this, we had, you know, something happening and uh, the risk decreased. So you can travel down the tree and actually see what, you know, unpack which, which parts of the tree were, were to blame for this, 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 uh, this decrease. You can see that uh, in this case, it was because the car was far, was not far from the intersection, it was inside the intersection and it was not driving slowly. So it was um, violating the, the specification. Yeah, so we um, trained this on naturalistic driving data, uh, new scenes, which has a thousand interesting scenes, uh, 20 second snippets and, you know, 40K uh, annotated frames with, you know, that are human annotated and semantic maps and everything. And so we um, basically trained our uh, risk knowledge is not using inverse optimal control. And we see that uh, basically it's giving us uh, what we'd expect if the car is stopped there in the center. Um, you can see that it, it kind of understands that the, the cars that are moving are the ones that are risky. The one that's next to it that's not moving and we're not moving as well is, is not a risk. And so it doesn't pay attention to it. Um, yeah, and so then there's also yeah, so as it's traveling, the ground truth uh, or, or our logic risk net uh, kind of attaches to the, the ground truth quite well and yeah, and produces the correct plan. So yeah, so how the, the question we want to ask after this is basically, okay, now we have this artifact that's learned uh, offline, can we adapt this to online settings? So how can we kind of adapt using these same constructs uh, you know, to the online situation and be context aware. So just to give some flavor to that, um, so imagine you're this, 
you're dividing, devising a um, kind of a planner for this red car, and this red car is what you deploy. It's 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 trained on maybe you know a population of data, right, from the real world. But you know, in certain situations, it just does not behave like the rest of the traffic does because the rest of the traffic is you know maybe moving faster in this situation. So you need to keep up with traffic in order to to keep safe. Um, so in order to do that, um, you know, not be too conservative, we uh, want to adapt to the scene. So to so what we do here, the key idea here is sort of cast this as a meta learning problem, where we sort of like take everything that we learned uh, pre previously using offline, uh, using offline using data, use that as a prior that we can then adjust online. And so we can say something like, okay, we can run this as if we were imagining ourselves as these other cars, these neighbor cars, and then see what they think is risky. And what they think is risky is, um, yeah, is basically learned uh, for, you know, in this case, four, four agents think, um, you know, it's less risky to drive fast, for instance. So then that, that could be used as, a, as an update rule that we can then use as an ego car to update our parameters as well. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so one, I guess, issue with that that you could imagine is catastrophic forgetting. So you could, you could easily wipe away everything you learned in one fell swoop by just basically learning by uh, doing this online adaptation. But if we use a moving average, you can remedy this. And so we can show that um, using the human as the ground truth, uh, the human kind of obeys if you, um, let me just replay that. Oops. Yeah, so you can see that the human yields to the other car that's uh, cutting in front of it uh, in that situation. And without adaptation, we see that the human does not yield to it. And so it basically uh, goes a little too fast through the intersection. It is aware of the, the surroundings, but only from like basically an average sense of a prior. But if we adapt, if we adapt online, we could basically recover uh, the human's ground truth. Okay, so the key takeaways from this talk were we developed a risk representation that expressively describes safe uh, behaviors with road agents and uh, is able to parameterize a, uh, using learning um, a logic risk net. So we devised this for uh, risk to making risk aware trajectory plans and um, adapted this online as well. So we, yeah, so a lot of this work is in conjunction with a lot of the, the co-authors you see here, uh, which we're eminently grateful for. Um, and a lot of the work can be found in these uh, two papers here as well. So happy to talk offline, but with that, I'll take any questions. It's time for one or two questions. Thanks for your question. Um, could you elaborate a little on the motivation for the risk of predicates and the robust metrics on the predicates to do something within the risk? Yeah, yeah. I think that um, the idea here is that we want to um, basically come up with a, a formulation that, that kind of assigns, like, you know, uh, for each of the um, each of the predicates on the rule that, you know, this is the this is something of the the the, the weighted and you know the weighted importance of that that uh, that rule, and you can kind of um, imagine that you know different different risk metrics are placed on different predicates too. So um, this gives you some some flexibility. But yeah, that, that is something that we're um, we're we're kind of um, that's an open question still. Is like how to do this in the right way? How do you uh, principally do this? Or if you have a high level version like uh, idea of risk. Then how can you um, how can you learn that maybe? So I think that's a good open question. But yeah, that's the idea. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Um, I have a question regarding the core formation technique. Mm -hmm. My understanding was uh, this that you know some as a weight to your distance that you keep from the neighbor. Yes. Um, when you do the weighting, uh, would it not get lost in the other cost of adding on the source code? How do you deal with that? 
Yeah, that's a good question. And I think that, so one of the answers is basically that you're at, you're learning all the other parameters as well. So the weights of, uh, you know, let's say um, like there was efficiency and there was, uh, yeah, there's, there's uh, like, you know, speed and things like that, or yeah, just some very uh, e egocentric costs. And you basically, after learning from data, you could verify this. And we, we did verify that, that it, um, uh, it, it does kind of re reasonably well uh, give the uh, attribute the right amount of weights to um, the ADO, like the, the external agents, as opposed to kind of like egocentric things in the, um, yeah, in it for, for the, uh, yeah. So for that cost function that I, that I just presented, I mean, there, there is, um, there is a potential function term too. So it, it strengthens as you get closer. And so that, that also kind of, um, increases the, yeah, but we didn't do any formal kind of checking of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, what if you use that as a constraint as a program? Was there a practical way you did not to impose that specific function? Yes, there was that other term that I left out, um, which actually had constraints as on the cost, uh, yeah, the randomized cost. And that is also a possibility to explore. And you could put predicates as, for that as well. And we didn't explore that, but that's a good future work. That's a great question. Thanks. Okay, cool. Uh, well, thanks for all the questions and thanks to the speaker. Uh, one more time.